Good afternoon. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, I am going to talk about uh, our experience of porting .NET Core to Unix. I am the member of um, team at Microsoft that was uh, doing the porting, and uh, I think it will be pretty low level. So uh, the plan is to have 30 minutes of presentation, then I have five minutes of demo, and in the end I will have five minutes left for questions. So if you can leave the questions until the end, it would be nice. But obviously, if you want to ask a question in the middle of my talk, please do so. So uh, is there anyone who doesn't know who, what that, uh, .NET is? OK. <laughs> so anyways, uh, .NET is a versatile application development platform that supports multiple modern languages. It uses. Uh, I should say managed languages, which means it uses garbage collection for, for memory management. Uh, the languages that Microsoft supports uh, or develops directly are C Sharp, F Sharp, VB.NET, or C++ slash CLI. But there are many other languages that uh, are supported by third parties, like Python and, uh, and others. Uh, and the .NET Core that I am going to talk about is uh, basically a new version of .NET that was created primarily for the purpose of ASP.NET, which is slim, uh, it is slimmed down on the framework uh, layer, and uh, it's uh, basically developed so that we can deliver great performance uh, on on .NET uh, web applications, but it's still very uh, useful and it can work well for other purposes like console applications and now for cross-platform development. So the porting of .NET Core to Unix has started in November 2014. Uh, and after a few months, we went public on GitHub. Uh, it was in February 2015. Uh, when I say we went public, it means that it's like living, uh, living development uh, of, in open source community. We are, it's not just a snapshot of, of the state of what we have. The, all the runtime is shared with the full desktop uh, framework, and we take contributions from both Microsoft people and from the community. And we have had a lot of, a lot of contributions from the community over, over the year. And the final release of this is planned for later this year. So for now, it's still a work in progress. There are still some rough edges. We are feature complete at this, this point, but uh, we need to work more on, on like the user friendliness of some, some tools and, and stuff like that. So here uh, on the left, uh, right side of the slide, you can see uh, a stack of the, of the .NET application. The orange stuff is uh, written managed code, which means uh, in one of our, our uh, managed languages. Uh, on top, there is an application. Under that, there, is a frame, there are framework libraries. And they depend on uh, special uh, platform abstraction layers for the, for the framework and on the managed runtime. And the managed runtime depends on native runtime. And, uh, and the native runtime depends on runtime PAL. This is like uh, Windows, uh, sorry, uh, Unix specific part, because uh, I'll talk about that uh, on the next slide. And underneath, there are the platform libraries like libc, librt, libunwind, uh, libssl, libttng, and so on. So obviously, the first uh, part that we needed to uh, create was the platform abstraction layer, or PAL. Uh, we have started uh, building it on top of PAL that Microsoft already created in the past for Unix systems for uh, Silverlight. But we had to do a lot of uh, modifications to that. Uh, the PAL basically emulates a subset of Windows APIs because the whole core, uh, CLR was originally written for, for Windows. So obviously, it uses a lot of Windows uh, APIs, like for file operations, console I.O., time, synchronization primitives, uh, like uh, waiting for events, uh, logs, and stuff like that for threading, uh, executable, executable files loading, because we have the same file format for Windows and Unix, the P file format for the managed applications, so we need a special uh, loader. For virtual memory management, memory heap, for general purpose memory allocations, and uh, 
uh, for uh, string operation, environment, locale, uh, and other. Uh, it also, besides emulating the Windows layer, it also implements some low-level stuff uh, that we needed for exception handling, I mean hardware exception handling, uh, and the native stack unwinding, which I'll both talk about a little bit later. Uh, as I said, it's present only for non-Windows systems, because on Windows we use just the Windows APIs. And uh, this is the only part of the uh, whole stack that is able to use platform header files, because basically we, uh, it needs to be like complete abstraction uh, for the rest of the system. And as I've shown on the slide before, we have multiple PALs. One is for the runtime, and we have several more for the framework libraries, so that we can version them uh, separately, because the framework is developed separately uh, from, from the uh, core system. So first, I'll talk about the basic differences that are between uh, Windows and Unix that we have to tackle somehow. Uh, First is the compiler, obviously. So on Windows, we use the Microsoft Visual C++ compiler. And on Unix, we have decided to use the new uh, Clang compiler, which is a stricter C++ compiler, uh, especially in C++ template handlings and in its sensitivity to various uh, not so uh, clean things in the sources. So first step was basically make it build with, with Clang. And uh, it's was uh, quite nice that it also cleaned up the sources. Uh, and Clank is a very nice, nice compiler. We didn't have any problems with the compiler itself, with the code, um, except for little assembler tricks that we needed to do. Uh, the, the compiler also has, uh, or those compilers also have different way to, to express uh, structure alignment, I mean memory structures alignment, inlining exports, thread local variables, uh, which are like Beckel spec in, in one of the com in Microsoft compiler or attribute in the in Clang or, or pragmas that are different. So these all had to be somehow uh, tackled. Then uh, the biggest difference uh, or bigger difference was in uh, the uh, W uh, character or, or the white character handling because on Windows W character is um, uh, and the .NET character type is UTF-16. It means 16 bits, while on Unix, uh, WHR is 32 bit uh, type. And since we pass a lot of strings between the managed code and the runtime, we cannot just like translate it uh, for the, from the like perf reasons. So uh, we had to, uh, we can, couldn't use the standard uh, white chart library functions for string manipulations. So we ha had to re implement them. The same for um, string formatting. And also some <coughs> printf and scanf formatting characters have different meanings on, on Windows and Linux. Uh, there is also a difference in the long type in, in, the, in C or C++. On, on Windows, it's 32 bits even on 64-bit systems, which is called LP64 data model, while on Unix, it's uh, 64 bits. Uh, then uh, there was a... Uh, the, we, on Windows, we use ETW eventing, which is eventing system for high performance events where you want to log how, for example, GC behaves, what it, uh, how often it does certain things. And on, on Linux, we have found a very nice replacement for that, which is LTTNG library, which is uh, uh, we have incorporated into the system. And quite. Uh, quite interesting uh, thing was this flush process write buffers function on Windows, which is a function that ensures that uh, all processors running certain process flush their write buffers, uh, which is used by the GC to uh, ensure visibility of changes in the thread state uh, from one th for, f that were done by multiple threads to other threads without the burden of having memory barriers everywhere. And there was no equivalent of such API on uh, Unix, or there is no equivalent of such API on Unix in general. Uh, so, uh, although recently a syscall called sysmembarrier was introduced to Linux kernel, I think it was 4.3 RC1, which we can use uh, in the future, which we plan to use, but in general on Unix, 
we had to use a trick where basically uh, the way to achieve flushing the buffers is to make the processors, uh, send the processors uh, inter uh, interprocessor interrupt, which uh, causes uh, the flush of these buffers. And to trigger this interrupt, we have a dirty memory page where we, we change its protection from uh, read writes to read only. And in that case, the system has to send this IPI interprocessor interrupt to other processors so that they don't have stale uh, records in their translation leukocyte buffers, which would otherwise allow them to write to memory that one processor has marked as read only. So that's why this interrupt has to be sent and the processor has to flush uh, this, this cached mapping. Uh, so this is, this is a trick that we used on OS X and other Linuxes and is used for the time being. And there were also other challenges uh, that we faced on, uh, on the side of framework libraries, uh, but uh, I won't talk about them because I was uh, involved with the, with the core system. So, uh, so uh, let's, let's move on. So uh, I guess that the biggest, uh, biggest uh, challenge was the exception handling, because if you look at the uh, stack on the right side, uh, which is a stack of some managed application or could be a stack of a managed application, you can see uh, um, on top, uh, at the bottom of the stack, uh, then there are some native code frames which are basically uh, the, the hosting application plus the runtime, then it calls into some managed code uh, which creates some, some stack frames that managed code can call into native code again uh, where you have some native code frames and it can call managed code again and, and so on. And so, uh, so and, and before I, I go into the details how we did that, uh, let me just like explain how the exception handling uh, works. So the exception handling works in two passes. In one pass, it goes from the top of the stack, uh, frame by frame, uh, and when, uh, until, and until it finds a handler for the exception. And when it finds the handler for the exception, which is a catch for, uh, in C++, for, uh, basically, then it starts a second pass. And in the second pass, it walks the st uh, stack again, but now it destroys all the objects on the stack, calls as destructors in C++, until it gets to the place where the exception is handled, and it reclaims the stack. So basically, after, when the exception is handled, uh, say, if it was in this frame, the, uh, then, then all of uh, this part of the stack uh, is gone. So uh, the, on Windows, uh, this could be done in, a, or I should, I should say uh, one more thing, that you need to have a way to, to basically walk the stack. You need to have a way to go from one stack frame to the next one, which is uh, easy on, on uh, for the native frames, because the compiler that compiled the native code generated that for you is stored in, in some data sections in the, in the uh, execu executable file, and the platform specific unwinder can unwind it. Uh, for the managed code, it's different because it's generated code and is generated by the just in time compiler. And on Windows, we didn't have any problem with that because uh, Windows has a centralized exception handling that allows you to register any function uh, with the exception handling code. You can, you can uh, basically specify uh, so-called unwind information for, the, for, for, each, uh, for each function. And, that then, uh, and the system then knows how to move to the next frame because the frame, uh, it means how to, uh, to get the IP address, the stack pointer of the next frame and, and to restore some registers. Uh, while on Unix, there is no such support for, for dynamic registration of this, this information. And so uh, what we basically had to do in the first pass, we, uh, or what we had to do, yeah, in the first pass, we used libunwind, which is a, a library available on, on Unix. There are two, actually, libunwinds. One is libunwind called libunwind8, uh, and the other is libunwind from the LLVM project which was not available as a separate library at the time when we started porting. So we used the other one, which is originally came from HP, as I've, uh, if I remember it correctly. 
And this library basically uh, understands the, unwind, uh, the dwarf unwind information that's in the executables on Linux and can unwind can, uh, the, na the native frames. For the managed frames, we use the copy of the Windows uh, unwinder uh, and the just-in-time compiler generates the Windows unwind style unwind information and we can use that. So in first pass, you basically walk the managed frames. When we hit the native frame, we switch to the uh, lib unwind and walk the native, uh, native frames and so on until we find the handler for that, uh, for that exception. Then in the, in the second pass, uh, we do basically similar thing for the managed code frames where we walk them using the lib unwind and call uh, for each frame we call uh, a function in the runtime that's uh, that's responsible for for destroying objects in the in that frame and doing all other needed stuff in the managed frames once we hit the native frames here uh, we need to switch to uh, some other way and we decided to you, uh, to unwind these native frames by standard C++ exception uh, handling mechanism. So basically, we change the context, uh, processor context, uh, to be the, the first frame uh, here, in the, or one frame below. We create a helper frame below the native frames and throw an exception, and it basically is handled by the standard C++ uh, compiler unwinding. And here, at the boundary with the managed code, we have a special catch that in case where uh, if the, the exception wasn't caught in these native frames somewhere in the middle, because it can happen, there can be handler as well, then we, then we, uh, ha and then we catch it here and switch back to our uh, managed uh, stack unwinder for, for the copy that I've talked about. And we can also find the handler somewhere here. And so, so the native frames are unwound by the C++ uh, exception handling and the managed frames are unbound by our uh, our stuff. And uh, as for as for hardware exception handling uh, on on Windows, they are handled the, uh, the same way as as the software exceptions. Uh, the structured exception handling system on on Windows uh, handles them in the exactly the same way. On Unix, hardware exceptions generate uh, signals, so we just catch the signals and then. I run our exception handling routines exactly the same way as uh, as we do uh, for for software exceptions. So there's just like little step in between. Next thing that was uh, different uh, was the calling convention uh, on the AMD 64 processor, which is the main uh, system, that, uh, the main processor that we support right now. Uh, it requires changes in the just-in-time compiler because it was generated. We wanted it to generate compliant code with the with the calling convention that's specified for for Unix. Uh, then we had some assembler helper functions that obviously had to be changed. Uh, then uh, there are changes in reflection invocation uh, because the reflection invocation goes through the runtime, the na native runtime, and uh, and p invoke, which is way to call native code from from the managed code and delegates in invoking. The differences are that uh, parameters uh, or in, in the way that the parameters can be passed in registers uh, on, uh, on Windows you have uh, or on Unix you have two more uh, general purpose registers that you can use for passing parameters which is RS, RDI and RSI and two more, uh, four more folding point registers, the XMM ones that you can, you can use. Um, and obviously the, the just-in-time compiler needs to know that and, and generate proper code. It needs to know that, for example, this pointer is always in the first uh, parameter, so it has to go to RDI, not RCX, and, and uh, stuff like that. Uh, then there are different callee safe registers, which are registers that basically the callee is uh, request, uh, required to preserve for the caller. So, so if a caller calls, uh, calls a callee and the callee wants to modify or use some of this, uh, these registers, he needs to store them and restore them before it returns. So there are like uh, two less callee safe registers on Unix because they are, they are used actually for parameters. But the, the biggest difference in, is in uh, structures uh, passing by value. When on Windows you can pass structs only that are like one, two, four, or eight bytes long, and they can be passed only in single register. 
and all of the others uh, are passed by explicit reference where you have a pointer in a register to the structure that's stored on the stack. Uh, on Unix, uh, it's, uh, there are structs up to 16 bytes long, can be passed and returned in one, of the one or two registers. And it can be a combination of general purpose and uh, XMM registers. Uh, and uh, this basically caused uh, the most changes that were needed in, in the runtime because uh, uh, that, that changed a lot, of, a lot of places. Now you can have, uh, I mean, it's, it's difficult to, to like, uh, explain in a short way, but you can imagine that, that uh, if you had a way where you specify a register index to pass a parameter, now you have two and, and they can be uh, like interleaved the, with, the, uh, with the folding main registers, it's, it's a complication. And larger ones are, uh, larger structures are passed on stack by implicit reference, uh, which means uh, there is no pointer in a, in a register, but it's like a fixed offset that points to the um, parent uh, caller frame, and that's where the, the structure is, uh, is stored. And similarly to, uh, for return values, where the, uh, on Windows, uh, the return value is, uh, can be in RAX for, for 1, 2, 4, or 8 bytes colors, not structures, uh, or in XMM, zero register for folding point or doubles or M128 register uh, types. On Unix, you can use RAX and RDX, uh, XMM0 or XMM1, and uh, you can also pass uh, or return structures uh, in the same way as you can pass them uh, to the function. And Obviously, on both systems, uh, if the return value doesn't fit into the registers for, for, uh, for some reason, uh, the call reserves space on stack and passes it as a parameter as in, in the first argument register uh, to, the, to the function. Uh, then, uh, runtime suspension uh, is, is another very important feature which uh, is n needed for the GC. Uh, it basically ensures that uh, thread, no thread is running managed code at the, at, uh, the time when the runtime is, is suspended so that the GC can walk the stack, find the objects that are on the stack, and uh, so it can know that, uh, that those objects and the objects referred from those are still alive. And uh, we have basically the way it works is that... Uh, that uh, you set some global flag in the, in, the, in the runtime that says now the suspension begins, and then there are three ways uh, how, how the actual suspension happens. One is that there is a barrier at the boundary between managed code, or where, where managed code calls native code, and this boundary basically, what it does is that when the native code returns to, uh, to that place, it just stops there waiting for, that, uh, for the runtime to end. Uh, if the code was not running native code, then, then we used two other ways. One way is to, uh, we call it hijacking return address, which means that we look up the return address of the current function and change it on the stack to point to our function that does the, the similar thing uh, as the barrier. It means waits until the suspension uh, is, is done. And uh, for certain functions, this wouldn't work very well because just imagine the function that has a long loop and you, you don't really want to wait until the, the loop ends for the GC to kick in. So, so for these functions, we uh, basically uh, interrupt, uh, redirect the, fun the, the context of the thread immediately to our, to our function. But these functions have to be specific, uh, specially prepared for that they, uh, so that they, uh, you can actually do it. Uh, on Windows and also on OS X, we use the thread suspension for that. Uh, it, uh, but on most Unixes, there is no uh, thread suspension API. The, the way it works with the thread suspension is that uh, we suspend the thread, uh, read its uh, context, it means the, the, process, uh, the process registers, check if it's in the native code. If it, uh, if it is in the native code, you just uh, let it run. Uh, because uh, it will eventually hit the barrier and it will never walk back to the, to the managed code again. For, for the other two cases, for the, for the hijacking, we just modify the return address and again uh, resume the thread and uh, it returns, once it returns from the function, it goes to our, our, our function that waits. 
And for the last thing, we, we modify really the, the context, the IP, uh, uh, to point to our, our function. For most Unixes, uh, as I said, there is no suspension API, so we use real-time signals uh, that basically interrupt the, uh, we send to, to the threads that we want to suspend. It interrupts the thread and runs a, a handler. And in that handler, again, we check whether we are in, uh, uh, we read the context because it's part of the um, uh, parameters of the, that we get from the signal. We check whether uh, it was running in the native code. If it was, we let it, uh, uh, we return from that and let it run. If it was, uh, if we can hijack the return address, we do that and return again from the handler. And if in the third case, we just wait in the handler until the suspension uh, is, uh, ends. So. That's, that's for, the, for the runtime suspension. Uh, the other part is a, is a hosting API that we have created uh, for, uh, so that any native application can host the, uh, the uh, .NET runtime and can execute the, the managed code. Uh, there was a hosting API in the Windows version, obviously, but it was based on COM, and somehow we figured that it wouldn't be a nice way to do that on, on Linux or on any Unix. So we've introduced a, a simple flat API uh, with just four functions that allow you to host, uh, host uh, managed code. Uh, it's a function for initialization of the, of the uh, uh, CLR, which is a, uh, it, it's called a common library runtime, then for shutdown, and then you have two functions to execute actual managed code. One is, uh, sorry, it's not, the, the first is executing an assembly where you uh, give, it a, give it an assembly which is, which is basically an executable managed file, and it runs its main, main function. And when it returns, this function returns. That's it. And you can call it multiple times if you need to. Uh, and the other thing is create a delegate function, which was created for uh, basically on demand uh, from, from some uh, people on, on the GitHub where they say, okay, we have a, a game engine and we want to use uh, managed code for, for the uh, runtime, uh, for, for our, for our like, logic, game logic, but we want to use native code for, for the graphics, obviously the engine itself. Uh, so, so this this last uh, AP, uh, API basically uh, allows you to create a function pointer to a managed function. It's not just a function pointer to that. There is it's it's called it's a pointer to some stub function that does some some uh, stuff uh, un underneath and then calls into a managed function. But you can create as many of them as you want and then call any managed function in the in the. Uh, uh, in your, your application. And you can call them as many times as you want until you uh, shut down the whole, whole system. These APIs use standard C types for parameters, so you don't, you don't have to uh, include any weird headers, any weird you know, Windows uh, type definitions and stuff like that. And when we did that, we decided it's, it's, good, uh, it's a good idea to, do, uh, to use it on Windows as well, so that we can allow application developers to use the same hosting APIs if they want to have applications that work on, on uh, both, both the systems. So now, now is the time for a short demo. How much time? 10 minutes, okay, cool. So I hope uh, everything will work. So let me... Open CentOS here, okay. Oh, I need to make it a little smaller, I was not sure. So let me show you how uh, you can get uh, the how we can get the uh, core CLR 
uh, I mean uh, the .NET Core framework and how can uh, you can uh, compile and run a simple application. So let me create a demo folder here. Then I'll I have somewhere here get for the oh, where it is. Oops, it seems I'm not connected. Okay, so. Okay, let me, let me actually skip this installation step because I don't know what's wrong with that. So there is an, an application uh, which is this program. It's a very simple hello world. So tell me what sh should I put here just so that... What? Okay. All right. So now we have this .NET tool that uh, has uh, several subcommands for for compiling and for for running and also for creating a distribution of of your application. Uh, this is not the only way how you can build stuff, but is the easiest to start with. So I'll say .NET. Uh, uh, Compile. All right. I say dot net run. Oops. Oh, sorry, bin. Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, here you go. Thank you. So let me go back to the presentation. Okay, so so you you have you will have you will be able to get this presentation later, and you have the link uh, to get the the tools. We obviously plan to have some better distribution means, so we will create RPM package with all this stuff. We already have packages for for Ubuntu, but for for Red Hat, it was I was hoping for uh, for it to be ready for this conference, but uh, unfortunately, it was not. So so you need to get this tarball and just untar it and you will get the binary for it in there. And uh, the way I've created, you can create a simple Hello World project is that there is this like helper command.net new, which creates you this, this simple, uh, simple Hello World uh, program. And then you need to restore the project's dependencies, which are the managed assemblies that it needs to use. And then it pulls them down uh, from, from the internet uh, to the local uh, subfolder. And then you basically do the .NET compile and .NET run. And you can use .NET publish, which basically uh, stuff, uh, takes everything that's needed for the application and puts it into a, a folder. And you can then copy the folder wherever you want and run just the application. There is an executable named by, by that application. You just run it and it, it, it works. So this is the end. So now uh, it's time for questions. If you have uh, some, I'll be happy to answer. Okay. Uh, you said that in MUI it's uh, Windows APA only used. Uh, what is the usual performance overhead? Of this it depends on what you uh, what API you emulate, right? So if you emulate get environment string, there is very little, little overhead, except for the fact that we have to convert the uh, get uh, environment string from from 8 bit uh, characters to to 16 bits but uh, difficulties uh, are in the area of of uh, like things like uh, logs semaphores mutexes 
uh, or for example waiting for multiple events which are things that uh, p threads which we use uh, on unix for, for threads doesn't support but i cannot really uh, well, I should put it this way. We have uh, run some benchmarks uh, of a code, uh, web, web server code, uh, compared to Windows and Linux, and uh, we are basically on par, in some cases, uh, a little bit faster on Linux, even with these. Uh, and the memory compact, can we maintain some uh, data structures in the emulation? Yeah, we, we have to. We have to maintain some, uh, for, for virtual memory uh, allocations, we maintain uh, some data structures so that uh, there, there is one unfortunate thing, which uh, is that, for example, the virtual memory freeing function on Windows doesn't require to, to supply uh, size of the region, while on Unix you have to supply it. So we have to somehow store it and remember it for all the allocations. So that was one of the things, but there, there is even for threads we have some like data keeping that we need to do. Uh, so so yeah. Uh, that was another guy, if I may. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it was it was very limited version. It basically was was uh, I think it was the stuff that was originally like used for for uh, the uh, server light, and then it was uh, it was uh, uh, but the stuff that was basically made public was was uh, the GC as as you said or jitter was limited because at that point we didn't have uh, we weren't that. Uh, open source friendly company and we just thrown out the here are the sources you can take a look do whatever you want with them but it was no like light development can you confirm that whatever code we have now is exactly or more or less the same code that we have now it is it is yeah uh, everything in the runtime is exactly the same there are if devs that are uh, for, for the full desktop runtime because it has more uh, some additional functionality that are not in the core profile but but it is it's a small lag coming down from github into you know into windows it, it takes a little time to get in so going back to the emulating question so uh, was it just determined to be like too much effort to re-implement or like why, why <coughs> emulate the abi versus because the the core CLR is quite big. I mean, this is this the native runtime, and like it has uh, these native uh, functions. Uh, I mean, the Windows functions call all over the place, and and we still want the same like runtime. It, it's not like Linux port. This means that the runtime that's on GitHub is the Windows one as well. It's like compiles for both, so we can, couldn't just replace them with uh, uh, something else, right? Yeah. It's Oh, you mean like uh, using using some some other effort? We we already had we already had that from the silver uh, from from that router and Silverlight. The PAL was basically there was the the PAL existed. We we just modified that. So we had when we started porting, we didn't have to create the whole PAL uh, again. Do you think you will ultimately want to reimplement, or is it? Uh, I don't think so. It's. Uh, I, I think it works pretty well, and uh, there is no, no reason. But if anyone from the community wants to change something, they are free to do that. Sure. I mean, yeah, everyone is welcome to participate because. Okay. Do you think that why won't be needed in the future on Linux to run some Windows application? Uh, Say it again, what, what would, wouldn't be? Uh, wine. Oh, wine. Well, for managed applications, well, there is, you know, this doesn't have any UI stuff, obviously. It will be, it will be kind of weird to try to simulate Windows UI on, on, on Linux uh, because it would look weird. Uh, and there are, actually, there are some, some, on the other hand, there are some community people that created the, uh, basically emulating, uh, you know, the frame, uh, the the uh, the wind forms on on Unix, so that it can work on, on top of that. But Wine is for native code, right? So uh, it's it's like it doesn't have uh, it can run anything. While uh, this this is just for 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 managed code. So I don't think it will. It's uh, like a replacement in a way. It's mainly for web applications. Uh, ours. 
Okay, so, yeah? Uh, I operate some small, uh, several application on .NET 4.6 uh, framework, mm -hmm. and uh, would like to move it to Linux. It just connects to Microsoft SQL Server via uh, some native uh, SAP client, or something like this, for the mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Um, there is a, there is a, a, a well, name, the SQL connection, the entity framework stuff. That exists for SQL Server, and we're also working with um, Oracle and MySQL, people like that, to make sure there's a .NET 4 capable you know, database driver. And then the application itself, if you go to um, uh, .NET, some API differences between, uh, well, it's mostly similar in the framework API, we did take the opportunity, had, we did take the opportunity of making some breaking changes to the API, um, so there are some changes in there that you'll need to pick up uh, because it's more modular and certain APIs have moved over in the documentation, but uh, normally about 90%, it depends what other dependencies you've got um, and if they are, if they have a core version supporting it as well, and um, we've only just got So we ran out of, out of time, so thank you very much for uh, your uh, attention and uh, if you have any more questions I'll be happy to answer them outside of this, this room, you, uh, I'll be here till the evening so if you see me just don't hesitate to ask, I will be in front of this room so if you, if you have questions right away I'll be uh, happy to answer. Thank you. And I have something for the first three question. <laughs> okay. Oh, I'm not, I have one already. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Je to možný? Pracuji v Praze, ale jezdím jednou za půl roku do Světlu. Potkali, určitě, na té večeři. Je, je. <laughs> A to jsem si říkal, že se mě nevypíská, jako... Tak, vypneme. Tak, hlavně, abych tady nezapomněl. Zdraví. Já jenom dopozorím hmm. malého kolegu, já jsem bývalý Microsoft. <laughs> Jo, 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 jo. Jo, jo, jo. Mhm. Uh -huh. A uh, ještě další jsou tam lidi češi, že jo, tam je, je vždycky vypadávají jméno, to je. Um, ze ze slo, Slovák, uh, uh, no tak Michal Strehovský. <laughs>